Who's the ultimate mafia soldier in The Sopranos? We're soldiers, you know. Soldiers don't go to hell. Could it be Benny Fazio, Furio, or maybe even Bobby Baccalieri Sr.? Join us as we dive deep into the top 10 soldiers of the Soprano crime family, evaluating their loyalty, cunning, and muscle. And here's a twist, it's not Patsy Parisi, and you'll soon see why. Stay tuned as we also give a nod to the rest of the crew. Salvatore Bonpensiero was a prominent figure within the Soprano crime family, operating a large gambling book and a thriving auto body shop. Despite these lucrative ventures, Sal's downfall was marked by his illicit side business, Dealing H. This risky move was in direct defiance of warnings from both his close friends and the mob boss himself. Hey Sal, you need money, you come to me. You hear what I'm saying? Don't be moving that H no more, puss. Highlighting a recklessness that seemed at odds with his otherwise successful operations. Pussy's life took a dramatic turn when he decided to cooperate with the FBI, essentially becoming an informant. His attempt to play the role of an amateur FBI agent, however, proved disastrous and comedic when he accidentally crashed into a bicyclist, nearly killing him. This incident epitomizes the chaotic and often incompetent side of Pussy's double life. On a more personal note, Pussy struggled with what appeared to be a serious opiate addiction, swallowing Percocet by the handful. This hack is taking me out of the game. I'm way behind. And I'll top it off, I think I'm getting hooked on these painkillers. This addiction likely clouded his judgment and hastened his downward spiral. Despite his criminal activities and personal failings, Pussy was portrayed as a decent father. His son, Matt, appeared to be a bright and promising young man, suggesting that Pussy did manage to provide a supportive environment for his family at least superficially. Yet, it's hard to feel sympathy for Salvatore. His life was a series of poor choices and harmful actions. Ultimately, his decision to ignore the Mafia's code of conduct led to his inevitable demise, a fate that, within the harsh moral landscape of The Sopranos, seems almost justified. Not in the face, okay? Give me that. Interestingly, Pussy's wife emerged as a resilient entrepreneur, building a successful business from the remains of what he left behind, showcasing her independence by investing in ventures like a new car and street loans. This contrast between the couple's fortunes adds a layer of complexity to Pussy's narrative, illustrating the potential for redemption and prosperity that he squandered. Salvatore's effectiveness as a mafia soldier is a tale of contrasts. He was capable of managing significant business operations and maintaining a semblance of family normalcy, but was equally adept at self-destruction and betrayal. Hey, Push. Do you even really exist? Anyway, four dollars a pound. Let's move on to the more capable soldiers of the Soprano family. Lost a lot of weight. Swimming, the best exercise. Works every muscle group. Get the fuck out of here. You, you never exercise once in your life. Let's take a moment to spotlight Peter Little Pauly Germani, a character who certainly spices up our beloved series, albeit not standing out as the most efficient soldier within the Soprano crime family. Introduced as the nephew and later corrected to be a cousin once removed of the notorious Pauly Walnuts. You took the air right out of my whole punchline, asshole. Little Pauly is played by Carl Capitorto. <laughs> well, you ought to know, sweetie. Not known for his strategic mind, he often leaves the heavy thinking to others positioning himself as a dependable foot soldier who follows orders with minimal fuss. Throughout The Sopranos, we see little Polly mostly in the company of Christopher Moltisanti, engaging in typical mob activities such as debt collection and intimidation. Who can forget the scene where he blares music from Tony's home entertainment system speakers on a boat to rattle Alan Sapinsley? Yet, little Polly's effectiveness as a mafia soldier is a mixed bag. His involvement in a dispute that magnified into a major conflict between Ralph Cifaretto and Johnny Sack over a tasteless joke about Ginny Sack's weight showcases, how his actions can inadvertently spark significant problems. His judgment is further questioned when Christopher Moltisanti shoves him out of a second-story window during a feud in the sixth season. Oh, no! No! Resulting in six broken vertebrae. Now, while little Polly might not have the makings of the criminal mastermind Benny, he certainly brings more to the table than just comic relief. His quick-witted exchanges and the ability to think on his feet during precarious situations, like robbing Chrissy's father-in-law or impersonating a detective, show a different side to him. 
Yet his naivety about the Mafia's cutthroat reality and his casual approach to the underworld's rules often land him in hot water. Like when he insulted a made man while still only an associate. Do me a favor, huh? Hold this. His behavior reflects the influence of his mentor, Uncle Polly, who often prioritized his own interests over properly guiding his young protege. If mentored by someone more invested in his growth, perhaps little Polly could have risen to be a valuable asset to the family. He showed potential by always staying sober and focused during business, unlike some of his more volatile associates. We're just breaking balls. Eugene Ponacorvo makes his unforgettable entrance in the episode Proshai Levushka. From his early days, Eugene quickly climbed the ranks, becoming a made man alongside Christopher Moltisanti. It's a thing of honor. And God forbid, if you get sick or something happens and you can't earn, we'll take care of you. His journey through the murky waters of the Mafia's demands reveals both his commitment and the heavy toll it took on him. Right off the bat, Eugene proved himself a valuable asset to the Soprano crew. His early tasks included guarding club entrances and dealing with the messier aspects of mob life, like disposing of a dead crew member. These duties marked him as a dependable and effective soldier, someone who didn't shy away from the family's darker demands. Eugene's deep commitment to the Soprano family was vividly showcased in season four, during Eloise, where he played a crucial role in jury tampering to ensure a hung jury at Junior Soprano's trial. Listen, Danny, we just want you to know how glad we are a guy like you was on that jury. That mob thing. His approach, subtly intimidating a juror, highlighted his ability to handle sensitive situations with a mix of stealth and threat, a testament to his multifaceted role within the family. His capability for violence, a stark yet integral part of his role, came to the forefront in unidentified blackmails. Eugene's violent outburst against little Polly Germani was a brutal demonstration of how he enforced the family's code. I knew that was coming! Hey! You're right! Oh. I'm sorry! I meant to hit you in the f***ing mouth! Oh. Oh. Although effective, his actions sometimes veered into excessive violence, reflecting the inherent risks of his position. Season 6 placed Eugene in an agonizing moral dilemma when he inherited $2 million. Despite dreams of a different, possibly better life, his loyalty to the family prevailed. Trapped by his own ties and acting under orders, he executed a critical hit in Boston. Teddy, right? Yeah. Hey! An act that underscored his unyielding devotion, but also his deep entanglement in a life he couldn't escape, even as an FBI informant. Is, was Ray Curdle a cooperator? The way things are shaping up, you're a designated hitter. Let's dive into one of the lesser known but intriguing characters from the series, Walden Belfior, the Shaw Slayer. Oh, oh! A soldier in Carlo's crew, Walden first appears subtly in the background of season six. It's easy to overlook him among the ensemble of mobsters that have circulated throughout the show. But Walden's role in the Soprano family carries significant weight, especially as the series concludes. Walden is a silent yet steady contrast to Christopher Moltisanti. While he remains low-key around the higher-ups... Walden, give me some privacy. Unlike the ever-ambitious Christopher, who often overstepped his boundaries, Walden's prominence in the family rises notably after Christopher's death. This juxtaposition is highlighted in Walden's interactions, especially with Polly, who is one of Christopher's main connections within the family. Interestingly, Walden's most memorable scenes include a heated argument with Polly about a cat fixated on Christopher's photo. This f***ing animal's history today. Pick him up. You pick him up. An argument reminiscent of Christopher's own conflicts. Moreover, Walden's name pops up in an intriguing family connection when Janice mistakenly refers to Angie Bonpensiero with the maiden name Belfiore. Walden, what kind of name is that for an Italian? I was named after Mr. Bobby Darren, Walden Robert Casoto. This subtly hints at Walden possibly being Angie's nephew, deepening his ties to the Soprano family. Walden is portrayed as an efficient and reliable mobster, a direct opposite of the troubled and often erratic Christopher. He is notably calm and collected, even in high-stress situations, like the execution of Phil Leotardo. Phil! Phil! Oh my God! This act alone arguably places him at a pivotal point in the family's hierarchy, marking him as a significant player despite his late introduction. Walden's effectiveness as a mafia soldier is underlined by his role in the climactic events of the series. 
His execution of Phil Leotardo was not just a strategic move within the mob wars, but also a narrative decision that emphasizes the stark, unglamorous reality of mob violence. There are no dramatic showdowns, just swift, unexpected actions carried out by seemingly minor characters. Now let's dive into the life of Benny Fazio and explore just how effective he really was as a mafia soldier. Benny, while often underrated, truly had the makings of a criminal mastermind. You're innocent, I get it. I'm just another victim of Benny Fazio criminal mastermind. That's right. Benny's presence on the show was marked by both his physical stature and his immense courage. Despite being one of the shorter characters, akin to Joe Pesci's infamous Nicky Santoro in Casino, Benny always had tremendous moxie for his size. My past is an addict. <laughs> in the world of The Sopranos, where physical fights and appearances can often mislead, Benny proved that real power comes from ruthless efficiency and sheer will. A few scenes beautifully highlight Benny's audacity, like his snappy comeback to Polly about being the only baby at the Bing when confronted about a mysterious cat. Well, you're the only baby here, so we're ahead of the game. You want to be wearing this f***ing pelt on your head? His humor and level-headed nature made him both a relatable and formidable character. Despite a memorable beatdown by Artie Bucco, Piece of dog shit. Little crazy motherfucking meatball dog shit. It's clear that in the Mafia, winning a fight doesn't necessarily equate to winning the war. Kill me after, if you want, but he's a fucking dead man. Calm down, Ben. Benny knew this well. He exemplified the ultimate wise guy philosophy. It's not about how you handle a fist fight, but how you manage the aftermath. Part of my life? Remember how he retaliated by not only surviving the scuffle with Artie, but also by landing a painful blow by scalding Artie's hand in boiling sauce? Benny's criminal portfolio is impressive. From playing a pivotal role in thwarting an attack on Carmine Sr. to orchestrating high-stakes operations like the Phil Leotardo assassination attempt. This way, sweetheart. There's something I need to get straight between us. He was also instrumental in various schemes, from outsmarting Feech LaManna with stolen TVs to the clever yet brutal handling of situations, like successfully intimidating that port security guard. One could argue that Benny's real strength lay in his potential for leadership. Among the younger generation in the Soprano crime family, he stood out for his ambition and effectiveness. Whether it was handling the dirty work or protecting his own, like when he helped safeguard Carmela from potential threats. Though there's a chance the bear was running to hide food from Ginny Sack. <laughs> He's so fat he goes camping. The bears have to hide their food. Benny showed time and again that he could be relied on for both muscle and strategy. Benny Fazio was not just a background character, but a burgeoning powerhouse in the mafia hierarchy. His journey from a soldier to what could have been a boss reflects a blend of cunning, bravery, and unwavering loyalty. Hey, your friend the Shaw was walking in when it happened. Him and some shkifuza got blown back on their keisters. Let's delve into the intriguing life of Mikey, who has been a disease since he was five. He's a nice guy, but he's like the grim fucking reaper. It's like he knows every guy with a fucking cancer cell and he can't wait to tell you. <laughs> Known for his cold precision and loyalty, Mikey was a standout character especially in his unwavering allegiance to Junior Soprano. Junior Soprano is the new boss. Mikey shined through his strategic and ruthless actions. He was a central figure in the early seasons, known for his critical role in many of Junior's schemes, such as the memorable hit on Rusty Irish or the Mo Green special of Brendan Fallone. Hi, Jack. Bye, Jack. This particular act underscored Mikey's ability to blend brutality with meticulous planning, a true mark of his effectiveness as a mafia soldier. One of the most pivotal moments in Mikey's career was his involvement in the attempt on Tony Soprano's life. Although it didn't pan out as intended, it showcased his commitment and readiness to follow through with orders, highlighting his loyalty. But this loyalty was a double-edged sword. It narrowed his vision, making him oblivious to the broader dynamics within the family, eventually contributing to his downfall. I swear to God, it wasn't me, it was Junior. You hated that kid, it was him. Yeah, right, it was Junior. Mr. Magoo. <laughs> Mikey wasn't just about the big moves. He was always ready to handle the nitty-gritty, the dirty work that the bosses preferred to avoid. This made him both valuable and feared within the organization. However, Mikey's approach wasn't flawless. 
His aggressive tactics sometimes lacked the subtlety required in the Mafia's intricate political landscape, which isolated potential allies. Furthermore, his personal vendetta against Tony revealed his limitations. His judgment clouded by emotion rather than strategic foresight. How you doing, Mike? How you doing? Oh. Oh. Ah. Despite these flaws, it's hard not to admire Mikey for what he was. A dedicated soldier. His style, fitness, and even his personal life added layers to his character. Were you this f stupid when I married you? Oh, f you. No, f you. And what are you doing standing there? Make the coffee. His wife's loyalty to his legacy after his passing only adds to the complexity of his character. He told me that he loved me and that he would be right back. Mikey was somewhat of a precursor to characters like Furio, had his loyalty been to Tony instead of Junior. Perceptions might have been different. Ultimately, Tony Soprano might have despised Mikey, possibly out of jealousy, as Mikey held a special place in Junior's circle, a trust and respect Tony coveted. Hey Mikey, that's the boy. What boy is that, Tony? The one you sleep with. Oh. Oh. Mikey's ability to perform without the existential angst that plagued Tony, highlighting the stark contrast in their characters, makes him a unique figure in the Soprano narrative. It's too bad they don't have a telethon for fuckface sighters, huh? They found a cure yet? Unfortunately, Mikey had to give up that nice suit. He got too attached to it. I heard Mikey had to give up that nice suit. Yeah? He got too attached to it. Patsy is a standout figure in the world of The Sopranos, known for his remarkable ability to stay cool under pressure, a trait that distinguishes him from many in Tony Soprano's inner circle. Unlike those who might rush to voice their opinions or curry favor with the boss, Patsy maintains a nonchalant attitude, subtly showing respect for the hierarchy and understanding that ultimately, it's all about business. My uncle's looking for at least 10. I'm talking here. This approach is vividly showcased during the tense discussions about Vito, where Patsy remains neutral, skillfully avoiding any stance that could jeopardize his position or the family's financial stability. Tone. When he was always talking about greasing the union, who knew that's what he meant? <laughs> Patsy's backstory and actions add significant depth to his character. Despite the tragic murder of his twin brother, Philly Spoons by Tony's crew, Patsy chooses survival over vengeance, prioritizing business and loyalty to the family. This decision highlights his pragmatic approach to mob life, balancing personal grief with practical needs. Adding a layer of humor to his character, the actor who portrays Patsy is a lecturer in real life. Oh, yeah? Imagine attending his class? Quite the departure from his serious on-screen persona. As The Sopranos approached its iconic conclusion, subtle hints suggested Patsy could rise to a more influential position, particularly if Tony were to fall. Notable scenes include Tony serving Patsy in an unusually deferential manner and Patsy's wife eyeing the Soprano family's wealth during a gathering indicating potential shifts in power dynamics. Despite being a background character for much of the series, Patsy's impact is significant. He achieves what many in his position could not, longevity and financial stability. Patsy even ensures his children pursue legitimate careers, with one becoming a lawyer, showcasing his forward-thinking approach to family and business. A noteworthy incident in Patsy's storyline is his confrontation with Gloria Trillo. Patsy, in a chilling display of loyalty and intimidation, threatens Gloria, warning her to stay away from Tony Soprano. Stay the f away from Tony Soprano. Shut the f up and listen. This encounter underscores his role as an enforcer and protector within the family, capable of handling delicate situations with a mix of subtlety and menace. We understand each other. It won't be cinematic. Patsy may not be the flashiest character, but his blend of quiet fortitude business savvy and strategic restraint makes him a formidable player in the Soprano family. He exemplifies how, in the volatile world of organized crime, it's often the quiet ones who wield significant influence. No, don't, huh? Sit down. Bobby Sr., affectionately known as Old Man Bacala, was a seasoned enforcer in the mafia world. Despite his brief appearance, he was depicted as the quintessential wise guy, a man who managed his family affairs expertly, guiding his son Bobby into becoming a made man without the typical initiation of committing a murder, a rarity echoed only by the brainless the second. His prowess was most notably showcased during his final act. Knowing full well that he was terminally ill with lung cancer, 
Bobby Sr. returned from Florida to handle a crucial hit on Mustang Sally, who had brutally attacked Vito's brother. This mission was his swan song, and he approached it with a mix of fatalism and fearlessness. The decision to employ Bobby Sr. for this job was strategically sound. Me sending an old man. What's he gonna do? Gum the guy to death? The mob knew he had a personal connection that would allow him to get close to the target. And since he was already facing a death sentence from cancer, there was minimal risk involved in using him over a younger, healthier member. This move showed a cold calculus. Oh man, Bacala is okay with this. What do you give a shit anyway? Bobby Sr. was almost dead anyway, and using him avoided wasting valuable manpower. Tony Soprano himself described Bobby Sr. as the f***ing Terminator. So what's this I hear? You got old man Bacala making a comeback? He didn't hear it from me, Tom. Highlighting his reputation for being a relentless and effective hitman. Beyond his mob duties, Bobby Sr. also showed a lighter side. That's right, we're talking about you, you cagey f***. Huh? He got him all fooled. This complexity made his character intriguing and multi-dimensional, illustrating that even the toughest mobsters had layers of personality. In his last appearance, Bobby Sr. demonstrated why he was an invaluable asset to the Mafia. He was a man who, even in the face of imminent death, carried out his duties with a blend of professional coldness and personal honor. His final act was not just about fulfilling a duty, it was about ending his life on his own terms, defining his legacy in the Mafia world. So I want to do it. It'll feel good being useful for a change. Now let's dive deep into the lives of the infamous trio known as the Taylors. Our friend over there is going to fit him for a suit. She's sending over two of her best tailors. This group of hitmen, straight from the heart of the Naples-based Camorra, played a chilling role that resonates with the menacing vibe of Henry Hill's description of Jimmy Burke and Wise Guy. They might be the type you could hang out with, but cross them or become their target, and your days are numbered. The tailors consist of Italo, Salvatore, and Roberto, three Neapolitan Camorra clan members loaned to Tony Soprano by the Camorra boss Annalisa Zucca. Referred to variously as tailors, cousins, or zips by Tony, these lethal gunmen carried out some of the series' most harrowing plots, including the assassination of Lupertazzi Capo Rusty Milio and his bodyguard. Not the belt parkway. As well as the tragic killing of Phil Leotardo's mistress and her father. Shut the rubbish. Their effectiveness as mafia soldiers? Absolutely terrifying. In the Luxury Lounge episode, Italo, alongside Salvatore, brilliantly distracts and then executes the mayor of Munchkinland. Then, in the heart-stopping The Blue Comet episode, Italo, mistaken in his target, ruthlessly kills Phil Leotardo's mistress and her father. Honestly, I'm still in shock as to how these competent assassins were able to mistake the old man for the Shah of Iran. It was obviously not Phil, because he didn't tell the courier he just met about how he did 20 years in the can. I did 20 f***ing years. And talk about their lifestyles. After completing hits, these guys were seen flying business class, buzzing about the Parker pens they snagged. The only question I have is, did they use DHL shipping when buying gifts for their loved ones? And a package uh, DHL Express for Mr. Philip. Furio, the beekeeper, hails from Naples, where he originally worked as a landscaper, reveling in the simplicity and satisfaction of manual labor. Growing olives, my hands in the dirt, the hot sun. This background gives him a grounded personality, unlike many of his American counterparts. <laughs> He's portrayed as someone who enjoys the little things, such as the scent of olives, which nostalgically brings him back to his days in Italy. It makes me very sad. This reminiscence shows his softer, emotional side, setting him apart from the typical hard-edged mobsters in the series. What makes Furio truly stand out is his professional demeanor as a mobster. <laughs> no bitch to me. Unlike the stoonads that Tony Soprano often dealt with, Furio brought a level of competence and mental soundness that was a breath of fresh air. He was tough, confident, and exceptionally restrained. Qualities that made him a perfect soldier within the mob. Imagine him handling business like the money collection from Valerie in the notorious Pine Barrens episode. With Furio in charge, it would have been a clean and quick operation, rather than the chaotic mess it turned into with Polly and the natural canopy. Give me one thousand dollars. One thousand more? Tony Soprano himself saw Furio as a representation of what the mob should be. 
Amidst concerns about the decline of mob quality due to informants, drug problems, and a general lack of dedication, Tony brought Furio over from Italy. Furio to start. Furio, two, but you should have shame. Oh! Back up, take it easy. Furio's entrance, wreaking havoc in a massage parlor, is still one of the most memorable scenes, showcasing his efficiency and professional attitude. <laughs> However, Furio's character arc is not just about mob politics and violence. His relationship with Carmela Soprano introduces a personal dilemma, adding depth to his character. Furio is a physically fit, charming man, a stark contrast to the corrupt, decadent lifestyle of his New Jersey counterparts. His ability to maintain emotional distance, his refusal to engage in petty mob politics, and his ultimate decision to remove himself from a toxic environment tell us everything we need to know about the integrity and professionalism of Furio. No bitch to me. In a sense, he embodies the concept of the mercenary, loyal to a cause until personal integrity demands otherwise. Furio wasn't just another mob goon. He was a cut above the rest a man who could have led Tony's crew to dominance if not for his own ethical boundaries. And don't forget his unique ability to instantly recognize a threat in the form of bees on anyone's hat. You got a bee on your hat. So was Furio the best mafia soldier in The Sopranos? Absolutely. See how good you survive this, Piazzina. If you're as intrigued as we are by the blurred lines between fiction and reality in the mob world, then you won't want to miss our full video on The Sopranos actors turned criminals in real life. Hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and drop your thoughts in the comments below. Until next time, stay wise and don't forget to hit that notification bell. Thanks for watching.